Okay, so we have 28 weeks infant who is scheduled by emergency C-section, not to have meconium at the time of delivery. Baby born after forest station start to have tachypnea, retractions, desets. Had a very, very common case, okay? Um, 28 weeks, work negral case, 28 weeks, born by C-section. Most likely here, it's a dimension, it's emergency section, so it's not elective C-section. And then there is meconium at time delivery. So meconium in full term in premature baby, it's very, very, very uncommon. As everybody knows, meconium should be seen in the term or post date. Very, very rare to see in the premature baby. That's here, it's big question mark. When you see meconium in the premature babies, okay? Um, and then baby become, have short breath. We need to figure out what's the differential diagnosis. Sorry, people just coming, continue to come. I have to accept their admission. Otherwise they're not gonna be in. Okay. So what's the differential diagnosis? When you think about differential diagnosis, number one, you need to do, number one, what's most likely diagnosed? And then what's other differential diagnosis? And then the third part is unlikely to be diagnosed. So um, we're gonna go back. This X-ray, so this X-ray we, we did around one hour of age. So what we think about this X-ray? I'm not gonna go detail because most, I hear that there's gonna be a chest X-ray uh, lecture. So I'm gonna leave it, uh, but I'm gonna go very brief, okay? So whenever you read X-ray in the NICU, you always pay attention to the or you always leave what you are looking for at the end. What does it mean? First, you try to look from outside to the inside. The lung is the last part that you are gonna pay attention to because otherwise you're gonna miss very important uh, values. So here we can see there is NG tube. I'm, look, I'm always looking if there's any lines, there's no big lines and there's no endotracheal tube. You can see the heart while looking there is no fractures. In baby, small baby, even fracture can initiate respiratory distress. So this baby doesn't have any fracture that is, uh, you can see. But what we can see in this lung, heterogeneous patch. You can see here, uh, heterogeneous obesity, which is not common in the RDS. You're not gonna see it in the respiratory distress syndrome. What we can see it in the meconium, aspiration syndrome, or pneumonia. Okay. There's another X-ray. What we think here? So there's another uh, X-ray for another baby. The same story. So here, what we can see, it's the lung looks clear, correct? Better than the previous one. And you can see the heart. You can see there is air bronchogram. You can see the trach, right and left main bronchus. But what's very important in this patient, what he has, the fissure line. So you can see there is line, that's the pathognomic for the transient tachypnic of newborn. So that's second differential diagnosis. The first differential diagnosis is the meconium aspiration. Second differential diagnosis, pneumonia. The third differential diagnosis, it's the transient tachypnic of newborn. How we know? By the fissure line. We know the baby full of the lung, full of the fluid. 30% of the fluid get absorbed just by start contractions. There is sodium channels that's turned on and then fluid start absorbed. The second 30% of the fluid get absorbed th through the mechanical, just by baby go through the birth canal. And you can see here, when the baby go through, uh, if the baby scheduled C-section or any baby who has C-section, then he's gonna lose the second 30%. If baby scheduled C-section, he's gonna lose the first 30 and the second 30. So baby scheduled C-section more likely to have that transit tachypnic versus someone who's emergency C-section versus someone who's uh, normal delivery. The last 30% usually when babies start crying, 
hydrostatic pressure open the lung and the fluid get absorbed. But you can see here, you can see very clear fluid because we know the right lung it has three loops and that's the fluid between the two loops. Okay. The third X-ray, you can see a little bit different here. You can see it's homogeneous obesity. It's all over the chest. Also, when you reach this X-ray, always try to count how many ribs. So here you can see it's low lung volume. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven and a half. So this baby has low lung volume and you can see it's very hazy X-ray. So that's differential diagnosis of the ground glass appearance. Number one, RDS. Number two, GBS pneumonia. RDS. Number two, GBS pneumonia. Okay. Okay. Their fourth X-ray, you can see pneumothorax. Very clear, you can see tension pneumothorax on the X-ray. So the differential diagnosis, every time you hear premature baby with meconium, sepsis, 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 and the top of the sepsis, listeria. That's board question, okay? Anytime you hear GB, a, gram, a baby premature who has meconium, think of the sepsis. Second differential diagnosis, RDS, because 28 weaker, baby born by C-section could be TTN, meconium aspiration syndrome, pneumothorax, those the most common, and then, other differential diagnosis, cardiac, or you're gonna think of that, it could be fractures, it could be diaphragmat hernia, or it could be other congenital anomalies. Next. We're gonna discuss now about the pathophysiology. So it's very important to know the pathophysiology of the, the respiratory distress syndrome. Before we go to the pathophysiology, we're gonna discuss about lung development. Why it's important to know the lung development? Because at least you're gonna know how you're gonna think about differential diagnosis, what happens to the baby. So as we know, if you look at the chest X-ray, uh, sorry, at, uh, at the image, the lung has five stages of development. Embryonic stage, zooglandular, canalicular, and then secular phase, and then alveolar phase. The, the lung starts from the foregut. The diverticulum started forming the respiratory diverticulum and then deviation to form the lung bud and then continue to grow. The lung histology, if you remember long time ago, the lung divided to the conductive zone and respiratory zone. The reason they called conductive zone because it's not precipitate in the gas exchange versus respiratory zone, it's precipitate in the gas exchange. Why it is important? Why I have to bring this? The conductive zone is supplied by the thoracic aorta versus the respiratory zone is supplied by the pulmonary circulation. We have something called lung sequestration. Where's the portion of the lung? supplied by the, so portion of the respiratory zone supplied by the thoracic aorta. So that's lung sequestration. So we know in the conductive zone, it's supplied by the thoracic aorta. After that, when you pass the res respiratory bronchioles all the way down to the alveoli, it's supplied by the pulmonary circulation. When you have portion of the respiratory zone supplied by the thoracic aorta, here's the pulmonary sequestration occur. And that's one of the differential diagnoses, but it's very rare. Okay. So back to the image. So in the first three weeks of life, that's the embryonic phase. And why important embryonic phase? because the tracheoceveal fistula occur in this phase. 
and then you have zooglandular phase where the nemosis type 2 occur canalicular phase where the nemosis type 1 formation and then secular phase and the last part is the alveolar phase we have to remember that when we deal with baby who's chronic lung disease we always reassure the parents that the baby will improve by the time if it's not very severe the reason why if you look at the last phase of the lung development it's called the alveolar phase it's continued the alveolization continue to the 10 years of age and that's very very important until 10 years of age the vascularity around the alveolation it continued to grow till the four years of age so if you have pulmonary hypertension, you know there's chance that baby is gonna be healed because it's continued to grow. Okay. Also, we I need you guys to know here the pneumocyst type two form the pneumocyst type one. So the pneumocyst type two is very important for surfactant production. The pneumocyst type two, the rules for the pneumocyst uh, number one the surfactant production number two formation of the pneumocyst type one which is came from the squamous epithelium the pneumocyst type one it's important for gas exchange okay also we're going to discuss about pulmonary surfactant why it's important? Because that's the board question here. It's a lot of the surfactant deficiency occur in this portion. It's air percent. So what's surfactant? Surfactant made mainly from the phosphatidyl choline. There's saturated phosphatidyl choline, which is around 50%, and saturated phosphatidyl choline, 20%. There is glycerol, phosphatidyl glycerol, and then there is 8% is very important, the protein. Why it's important? Because we have four types of protein, protein A, protein B, protein C, and protein D. The one cause human disease, it's the protein B and protein C. So when you have the baby who born with severe respiratory distress and they might die because severe respiratory failure, if you send surfactant, it came back surfactant deficiency, think of that surfactant protein B deficiency. And the way people remember, so surfactant A and surfactant D, they are out the outer part, those hydrophobic. So they are water soluble. The function is the immune mainly. And, and otherwise, the surfactant B and surfactant C, they function as a phospholipid. That's the difference. They are hydrophilic, they are fat soluble, it's important as a surfactant. What's the function of surfactant? Decrease surface tension and improve the compliance of the alveoli. So if you have the alveoli, usually inspiration, expiration, when there is no surfactant, the wall is very sticky. So during inspiration, it's good. During expiration, the wall touches each other and then it's very hard to open. So that's the surfactant. The type B, usually very bad start at birth severe respiratory failure type c usually childhood interstitial lung disease usually start slowly and progressing toward the childhood so that's the way you guys remember a and d outside are immune function they are fat, water syllable b and c they are fat syllable and deficiency of b and c is reported in the human being and cause severe surfactant deficiency so how function, how surfactant secreted and absorption. So also why it's important to know this, because usually, uh, Dr. Ayman, usually how many doses of surfactant usually we give? Uh, usually we just give one to two doses. Why? But it is exceedingly rare to uh, give higher than that. Do you know why? Uh, because the uh, pneumocyte cell will uh, will will um, will secrete uh, endogenous surfactant as long as you provide the Good. oxygen and 
so, so, hemodynamic so stability. Yeah, let's let's explain here what Dr. Ayman said. Okay, so surfactant produced from the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, there is surfactant B and C with the phospholipid, and then secretory surfactant A and D, excreted through the exocytosis. You can see the surfactant complex here. It looks like laminated on the histol. If you look at the under microscope. 90% of surfactant after produce function recycle. So that's the reason. Because 90% of the surfactant, whenever we give it, is gonna be recycled. 90% recycled. So if you give one, there's high chance still baby has surfactant. Very few required second dose because it's still there. But after second dose, very, very, very unlikely it's gonna work because you know it's already there. It's whenever you give it, it's still there. The 10% is going to be reupdated by the macrophage. So just to know that what we are looking for, that's the squamous cell epithelium, alveoli type 1, nemosis type 1, cuboidal epithelium, nemosis type 2. There is macrophages, the surfactant production through the sacro in the plasma reticulum. It's laminated, exocytosis, reabsorbed, 90%. 20%, or sorry, 10%, just uptake by the macrophage, but the remaining just closed loop cycle. That's why usually we don't require uh, more than um, two doses. Although very, very rare, we give the third dose. Next, we're gonna discuss about, and that's the reason why I have to bring all these because once you master those, it's gonna be easy the next. So we need to understand now what's the Leblas law. Leblas law, it's about what happened. Why baby who has respiratory distress start fine at the beginning and then slowly is getting worse and worse and worse. Because, and that's explained by Leblas. What Leblas uh, explained, what he said. So let me administer the physics here. So if you have two balloons, one, it's well inflated. And the second one, it's less inflated. And you connect two balloons together. And there is valve in between. If we open those valve, what do you guys think, what's gonna happen? There's three options. Number one, <laughs> this one gets collapsed and this one gets hyper expanded. Correct or wrong? Second option, this one gets less and this one open. The third option, it's like this. So the answer to this one in the real life, when you have the two balloons open together, the valve in between, the one, the big one is get bigger and the small one is get collapsed. So that's what happened. The alveoli is connected each one together. They are connecting together, okay? So once baby has unstable alveoli, it's gonna pull the air or it's gonna further collapse. And the one it's inflated is gonna be very further inflated. And that's in this side is gonna create pneumothorax and other side is gonna be collapsed, inflammatory markers and pulmonary edema, secondary to the inflammation. Is that clear? So Leblas, what he said, the pressure inversely related to the or proportion with the surface tension and inversely related with the radius. Smaller the alveoli, it's higher pressure and higher surface tension. And that's why the alveoli further collapse because the small one here, the smaller one, what's gonna happen has smaller radius. So that means higher pressure, higher surface tension, push the pressure toward the bigger one. So this one is farther, get bigger. And the smaller one, what's gonna happen to this one is gonna get collapsed. Is this clear? Okay, next. So, now this baby, how we deal with the baby at the beginning. So before, let's, they call you for premature baby, 28 weeker. They said there's meconium. We have something called pre-breathing 
and then we go for resuscitation and then we do something called deep breathing. What does it mean? So we sit with the team, we discuss about the conditions. History, more history about the mom. What's the history? And then we discussed about it with the team and the team made from physician, nurse practitioner, respiratory therapist, and then um, the nurse, the admitting nurse, and then we have the one of the transport nurse in case we would like to do, um, in case we would like to do um, um, lines. So um, the, we discuss about the patient, whether the mom, if anything in the history I need to know, how long she's been ruptured, any risk for the infection, if the mom receives steroids, and we will discuss why it's important. If the mom received magnesium as a tocolytic for the brain protection. And then we divided the rules. Each one has his own rules. And the physician stay as a team player. And then we go ready for the resuscitation, ready for the admission. So what's the rule of the steroids? According to the ACOG or the Metenofitamids recommendation, any mom who is on preterm labor or expected to have delivery within seven days, she should get steroid within, um, if she is between 24 weeks to 36 weeks, plus six days. That means anyone less than 37 weeks, if there's any expectation to have delivery within seven days, she should get a course of the steroid. Usually, so there is two doses of the bitamethasone, two doses of the bitamethasone, IV, if the mom, she is, let's assume that I give two doses of bitamethasone, her contraction stop, she went home and then she came back. If she came back, and the last dose was 14 days prior, then she's qualified for the rescue dose. So the recommendation, anyone used to be 34 and below, now anyone less than 37 weeks, she should receive steroids if at risk of the premature delivery or she starts to have rupture of membrane. Why it's important to give steroid? Because the evidence already there, the steroids decrease the respiratory distress syndrome, decrease the risk of the intraventricular hemorrhage, necrotizing enterocolitis, sepsis, and mortality. But as you guys, you can see here, there, those risks not including the chronic lung disease. So the only that does not proven yet, steroid does not prevent bronchopulmonary dysplasia or chronic lung disease. Again, steroids does not prevent chronic lung disease or bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So which medication that prevent chronic lung disease that's proven by evidence base? We have caffeine and we have vitamin A. That's the only medication it's been proven. Everything else, anything else that we've been used, steroids, uh, either antenatal or postnatal. Uh, we used um, bronchodilator, lasers, diuretics. Everything that we use is not proven. Okay. Ayman, I have a question for you. Yes, please. I thought the corticosteroid, the OM, either pitamethasone or hydrocortisone, from 20, now I guess they changed the criteria from 23 to, to 34 to 33 plus six. Yes. But so the, this was, yes, that, that was all the criteria. So now they changed the criteria. So the criteria, they changed it to the 36 and six days. Okay. And, um, and you can see the, there is variation between um, recommendation from the ACOG, which is the American um, College of the Obstetrics and Gynecology, and the okay. Metabolic Medicine. Um, uh, there is variation of that. Um, they said, so all, if there is less than 34, that's mandatory, okay? And that's the must. There are some recommendation, they said, no, if she's, after 34 weeks, and there's potential for preterm delivery within seven days, and scheduled C-section, she should receive the steroids. 
Make sense? That's the, here the differences between the 34 and the 37 weeks. So maybe you look at that. Before, yes, I agree with you. When I did my training, 34, below 34, that's the, we give. After 34, we don't give. Now they move it to the wider because the benefit way more than the risk. How about if you have 22 weeks or then? Yes. So less than 24 weeks, that's the discussion between you and the patient. So let's assume that you have 34 weeks and the mom, she wants everything to be done. Then you need to discuss with the, between the parents and the physician, the pediatrician, um, the, or the NICU and the OBGY. Because if your center, let's assume that your center does not resuscitate their 23 weeker, period. Uh, I trained in the places that they don't resuscitate 23 weeker. Then unfortunately you cannot, the OBGY, he cannot give steroids because you are not resuscitating. You're not gonna even go to that delivery. Now the people, they move even farther down. So the 23 weeker and below, that's optional. That's a discussion. In my training, in my place now, what, what, what we are practice, anyone less than 23 week, we don't offer the resuscitation. Anything above 23 and zero, or 23 and above, usually we automatically, we start steroids because they know that we will resuscitate the baby. Make sense? If you have, if you have 22 and five days and the mom, she want everything, I have a baby who went home 22 and five, they discussed with me. I told them I will resuscitate because it's two days and there's always a chance that um, date error and they have to give, they give it. So it's not a solid line. So that's the difference here. But everyone more than 24, they should receive um, steroids. Okay. Okay. So. Part of the discussion we said about the steroid. The second part of the discussion about what kind of the respiratory support we're going to offer. So if you have 24 weaker, 25 weaker, 28 weaker, what kind of respiratory support is always, always, always in favor of the non-invasive over the invasive as a first line of treatment. I know still a lot of centers they intubate baby who is less than 26 uh, weaker or 25 weaker. The, still, the recommendation is all baby, if you look at the evidence, they should give a chance to do non-invasive over invasive, unless baby has no spontaneous uh, breathing or severe respiratory distress and um, uh, severe metabolic acidosis required intubation. If it doesn't work, then you need to go to the, you need to intubate the baby. And usually we choose the volume guarantee. We will discuss further. Uh, some center, they place baby on high frequency. And that's the there's centers variation. We will discuss further. Okay. So I don't know. Um, okay. So um, there is. Several studies, which is already proven, systemic review study shows CBAB is more effective with lower mortality and reduce the risk of the bronchopulmonary dysplasia compared with intubation with or without surfactant. So that means if the baby born premature, always place baby on the CBAB. Okay, and we will discuss about the surfactant later on. Which one is better, CBAB alone? versus intubation, always CBAB alone. And that's based on the multiple study that has been proven already. If the baby, which one is better, give CBAB or do the something called insured trials. That means you intubate, you give the prophylactic C surfactant, extubate back on the CBAB. The study showed that it's similar. But in fact, when you intubate, you expose the baby risk for intubation. And there's always risk. So that's why always try to avoid intubation if there is possible. Also, the study look at the long term over 18 to 22 months. That, at that very big trial, it's called support trial. It showed there is no difference. Even if you're going to follow long term, it's equal result. So why you have to intubate the baby if the long term is a similar? 
So we're going to go more depth on the CBAP, non-invasive. So just uh, in brief, so we have non-invasive. We have high flow nasal cannula. And we have CBAP. And we have bilevel. The high flow nasal cannula, by definition, any flow more than one liter. Anything more than liter, we call high flow nasal cannula. Heated high flow nasal cannula, it's more than two liter. Anything above two liter, we call it heated. It has to be heated high flow. So heated 37, humidified 100%. High flow nasal cannula means more than two liter. Okay. Anything about below one liter, we call it low flow nasal cannula. And usually that's the step down in case of the chronic lung. CBAP. CBAP, we have two types of CBAP. So we have constant flow CBAP and we have variable flow CBAP. What does it mean? Constant flow CBAP, that means it's the during inspiration or expiration, it's the same pressure. So if you set the pressure of five, it's all the time five, inspiratory, expiratory. Versus in variable pressure, it's difference inspiratory is going to get the, the number than different than expiratory. Constant, we have two modes. Either we connect it through the convention, through the vents. So we have, if you connect the mechanical ventilation through the nose and you said, I need CBAP, it's going to deliver CBAP and you connect it to the interface, either nasal mask or nasal branch or ram cannula. The, the second part, it's bubble CBAP. And the bubble CBAP become more popular after people look at the data from the Columbia Hospital. They have the lowest here in America and uh, um, New York. They have the lowest chronic lung disease. And when they dig in the his, what, what they are doing different, they use bubble CBAP. And you can see here, that's the bubble CBAP. So that means you set the flow, how much flow you wanted, five over like flow or six flow. And then you dig it in the container of water and it has a numbers. So you, when you ins dig it a little bit deep, so if you leave it at the six, that's the pressure is gonna generate. So you said, I need a pressure or the CBAP six over six. That means six flow, six uh, peep. If you said I need five over five, that means five pressure, five peep. Okay. Variable flow, that's the infant flow or CBAP or BIBAP. We will talk about it later on. Advantage, disadvantage, each one. The interface, that means which connection that you can connect, either nasal mask, I'm talking about non-invasive, or nasal branch, or ram cannula. And I'm gonna show you guys a difference. So that's here on this side in the image, that's the CYBAP. What's the advantage of the bubble? So bubble, if you look at the images here, that's the way it goes. It looks like high frequency, because bubbling. If you compare the bubble CBAB with the convention, in this X, so you can see the pressure, and in this side, you can see the flow. So in the convention, it's constant. The same flow always. So you go higher, it's gonna be the same. Versus in the bubble CBAB, if you go higher on the flow, you're gonna give you higher pressure. So that's the difference. It's easy, it's very cheap and expensive and easy use and very friendly use. The disadvantage of this bubble CBAB, unfortunately there's no built-in monitor. There's no monitor built on it. So what does it mean? If the baby lost the noise, for example, nasal mask and the baby lost the, the mask, then it's not going to beep. Nobody will see it. How do you know that is off? You, if you're going to see no more bubbling coming out, you know that is off. If the baby lost because it should be completely sealing on the baby nose, if it's get disconnected, the bubble stop, then you know that um, and baby start desats. So that's the issue with bubble CBAP. So you need to constant monitor. And also there's potential for increased work breaks on the uh, bubble CBAP. Infant flow, the infant flow, how it's work. So that's on the side, that's the connection. 
So infant flow during inspiration, you deliver const the same, so it's gonna very flu fluently go the flow, but during expiration it has flip, it come back. So it's more synchronized with the baby's breath, more fancy mode, but at the same time, it's more expensive. Which one's superior than another? So far, there's no data prove this better than this or this better than this. Theoretically, the flow, variable flow, it's more friendly used by the baby. There is terminology called CBAB failure. It's very important to know. If baby, let's assume that you place baby on the CBAB and the baby starts having increased oxygen breath to the point that you need to intubate the baby. And this point called CBAB failure. People, they start looking at what does it mean? At what point I need to predict the baby might be failed CBAB. Why? Because baby who fail CBAB or have failure or CBAB failure, they are more adverse outcome. They have more mortality, more pneumothorax, more IVH, more bronchopulmonary dysplasia compared babies who does not fail on the CBAB, which is makes sense. So there is a big study done by the Dergville, um, large cohort study, 19,000 inborn infants in Australia, New Zealand from 2007-2013, they found the best predicted value of CBAP failure if the baby required more than 30% of oxygen in the first few hours of life. But people here, they said you have to be careful because you need to correlate it with clinically. So if the baby, because as we know, we have something called golden hour, that means within first hour, everything should be done on the baby, should be in the place, lines in place, it, at, during the time, even especially during the line, it's going to be, baby, he might have increased oxygen because already baby under sterile shield and people, they do the procedures. So that hour is not included. You need to correlate baby with the gas and you need to correlate with this baby clinical status before you consider CBAP failure or because, before you consider the values. There is another study done in 2019. They, they bring it the same result but they said at the two hours of life. So at two hours of life, baby required more than 30 percent, most likely baby will fail and required intubation. Next, it's non-invasive post pressure ventilation. So what does it mean? So we have the convention, whereas you have bi-levels. That means you have the PIP and you have the beep. So two levels, okay? The BIP and you have the beep. Uh, that's called an IBBV, which is non-invasive intermittent positive pressure ventilation, like the, the like mechanical ventilation, but just delivered to the nose. We have CYBAB, which is used the mean airway pressure and the beep, the same principle. So the question is, which one is better? Which one am I gonna place on my baby? Do I need to place CBAB or I need to place the NIV? What we know as a evidence from the big Cochrane trials they found that baby who have the, um, the only advantage of the NIV over CBAP, it's failure extubation rate. What does it mean? If you have microbremi, very tiny baby, 500 gram, 1000 gram, and baby was intubated for any reasons, and you wanna extubate the baby, you better use the NIBV because it has a rate. So it makes sense, it's gonna deliver some rate. Other than that, there is no evidence support NIV over CBAP for chronic lung. There is no evidence support for the mortality. The only evidence that support superior NIV over CBAP, if you fear of the baby might fail from the CBAP during extubation, then use the NIV. And that's what we use most of the centers. So if the baby already intubated, small, tiny baby, 23 weaker, 24 weaker, if you wanna extubate the baby, we usually start with NIV because we know that they're gonna do better on NIV, then slowly we into the CBAP. Okay, so those, the interface that I'm talking about. So this one, nasal cannula, that's usually used for the low flow nasal cannula. That's the OptiFlow, usually used for the high flow nasal cannula. And you can see it has a coil because of the heated, high flow nasal cannula. So instead of the water precipitation and uh, annoying the baby, it's more dry air because of the heat all the way down. And that's help. 
run cannula. You, also, I need you guys to pay attention. When we said high flow nasal cannula, it should cover less than 50% of the nostrils. Versus if you use it as a CBAP, that's called ram cannula. You can see it thicker. You need to cover at least 70 to 80% of the baby nostrils. If you see it less than 70%, that's not the right ram. You need to change it to the right one because there's different sizes. Again, I'm gonna repeat this one again because it's very important. People, they, uh, they have to know this one. So OptiFlow, any nasal cannula used for high flow nasal cannula or low flow, it has to cover less than 50% of the nostril. For the, if you use it as a beep or CBF, it should be covered at least 70% to give the ideal pressure that we are looking for. That's the different interface. So you can see nasal mask in the side and you can see nasal branch. Which one superior than the others? So far, nobody, um, both of them is the similar. In fact, a lot of center, they alternate because each one has advantage disadvantage. With the nasal mask, there is advantage of the septal deviation with the time. Versus nasal branch, there's always chance of the septum perforation. So people, what they do, they alternate mask and nasal branch. At least they can they get benefit of the both of them. The, those versus ram cannula, the issue with ram cannula, there's always one to two pressure less than what you order. So what does mean? If you order beep of five, that means baby get four or even three. If you order beep of six, that means baby most likely is gonna get five because it's not complete sealing system. It's not like the nasal bronze or the nasal mask. It's completely sealed. The, the ram cannula is always not completely sealed. But the nurses, they love it. Once you add, bring it to your unit, it's very hard to take it away. So that's why some centers, they use it, but limited to the any baby more than 32 week gestation. And they don't use it in the babies who's less than 32 weeks gestation. The reason why people, they don't use it, and now the study coming more and more because it's widely used in the ram cannula in the United States. Uh, the one who uh, invent uh, ram cannula, Dr. Ram, he's from the University of South California. Um, in preterm infant with RDS, ram cannula used at the interface result in increased invasive ventilation, surfactant use based on 129 premature babies. So people now, they start looking at Ram cannula used in tiny baby, is it the right decision or no? Nobody knows the answer yet, but a lot of centers now they're questioning the using ram cannula in very tiny baby. Or what we do right now in my center, we use higher pressure to compensate the leak. So we start BIB of six instead of BIB of five. And all babies, uh, v uh, very low birth weight babies who is less than 32 week gestation. Okay, so you, uh, you, bring, you went to the delivery room, you placed the baby, you discussed about the, with your team, that's called be, be brief. You discussed about delay cordic clamp because very important. And you told them, okay, we're gonna start CBAB, we're not gonna intubate. So surfactant, there is two types how to give surfactant, either rescue or prophylactic. Which one is recommended? The, by the recent studies, they recommend more use surfactant as rescue rather than prophylactic. Systemic review of study comparing surfactant administration as a prophylactic versus rescue. So prophylactic, it means immediately all babies, tiny baby, we expect it to gonna have RDS within an hour, just intubate, give surfactant, pull the tube out, place baby on the CBAP. That's called in short trials. The rescue, that means you wait until baby show higher, higher oxygen, which is FIO2. I'm gonna go to the numbers later on. So 30% or 40%, if baby starts showing this process, getting worse, then you, you do the insure. That means you intubate, give surfactant, extubate back to the CBAP. And in fact, they, sh they found that baby who have rescued the surfactant less likely to develop chronic lung disease or combined chronic lung disease or death. 
than the um, prophylactic surfactant. But that does not prevent from bringing surfactant always in the delivery room. So if you go to the delivery, if you expected premature baby, less than 32 weeks, always surfactant should be available at delivery room. Why? If you, by any chance, baby required intubation, he should get surfactant because the whole idea of rescue versus prophylactic, avoid intubation, avoid trach perforation, avoid risk of intubation. Because once you intubate the baby, there is chance of that, initiate the inflammatory markers. So that's why. Um, so if baby by any chance require intubation, then you need to give surfactant. You don't wait for the FI2 to go up. Or if the baby is getting worse, then uh, you need to give the surfactant even in the delivery room. Surfactant, we have natural surfactant, we have scientific surfactant. Both of them are effective. But as we know, the natural surfactant is superior. Why? Because the scientific does not contain protein B and protein C yet. In the United States, widely used cursive and Cervanta. So cursive, it's the Italian company. They use from the bork, lung, mice, versus the Cervanta from the bovin or the cow. Usually we give two doses. We prefer only two doses. Very, very few conditions. I explained why Let, um, we give the third dose, but usually baby require no more than two doses. The differences between the cursive and the Cervanta, the cursive, you give it every 12 hours versus Cervanta, you have to give it every six hours. And then you have to look at the manufacturer recommendation. Okay, so what's the target FIU2 in order to give the rescue? Be able to look at the multiple data. Most of the people, they follow the 2013 European guidelines. So European guidelines, they have very wide data and they recommend if the baby less than 28 week gestation, the target FIU2 is 30% or the fraction of the jet fraction is 0.3. If the baby older than 28 week gestation, then the target 40%. This data come to the American people, they look at this data, it's very good data, but because of that they have a little bit, two numbers, 28, less than 28, some centers they choose 30 as a landmark. Any baby more than, required more than 30 regardless of the age, gives the factant. Some centers they do 40%, some centers they do 35%. So that's that there's centers from one center to another, there's variation. In my center here, we use 40% cut point for the surfactant. So how how surfactant being administered? The insured trials as widely used and famous through intubate the baby, give surfactant, pull the tube out. Nowadays, especially in Europe, they widely adopted LISA, called LISA, which is less invasive surfactant administration, or MIST, which is minimal invasive surfactant administration. The principle is the similar. Just this one is the European, they called LISA, especially in German, less invasive surfactant administration. In the United States, they changed the name and they use different catheter, they called MIST, which is minimum, invasive surfactant administration. The inhaler one so far is not uh, approved and uh, the, they start multi-center trial, they use it and then stop it. So it's not as a, uh, not, the data is not promising. So we will discuss more about LISA and LIST because it looks like promising and it has a good result. Although, I look at the old study that uh, been published, none of them uh, strong enough uh, to have the, um, um, or the strong uh, evidence base. So there is six clinical trials. They use the LISA. So what does it mean? Let me explain LISA before or the MIST. 
So Lisa, what they said, the principle of the Lisa. So what they said, instead of placing the tube, intubate the baby, give surfactant, they let the baby on CBAP, the baby's still breathing, and they use the feeding tube, specific surfactant tube, is as small as a feeding tube. And they place it, so that's the focal cord, and they place it without blocking the, the focal cord. So just, we're gonna go back to that previous intertracheal tube. So you have the focal cord, you intubate it, you block the focal cord. So what happened below the focal cord? All the alveoli is collapsed. Then you give the surfactant, you open it, and then you place baby on CBAP. They said, why I have to block the entire focal cord? Why, or the airway? Why I have to use the, the large intertracheal tube? So that's the principle of the LISA or MIST. They use feeding tube or surfactant tube. Is it similar to the feeding tube, a little bit thicker? And while baby on the CBAB, he's still breathing. They get surfactant and then they pull the surfactant tube out. And now in German and Europe, they have specific surfactant tube. In the United States, the MIST, what they do, they use the angiocatheter, a sticker and the same principle. In, in the um, Moni Balmer in the um, Orlando, a big center, 130 bits, they use the uh, umbilical catheter instead of the angiocatheter. So they use umbilical catheter, the same principle. They sometimes they use Magella forceps, sometimes it's just by your hand. And just you intubate the baby using the laryngoscope. You look at the focal cord, you take, you insert it. So you can see still babies on CBAB, still babies breathing. You give your surfactant, you pull it out. So you did not collapse the entire. And if you look at the result, the result, all the result is promising. Although, I, as I said, as the evidence is not, there is no like clear, big size, sample, randomized control trials. It's very strong evidence, but almost all the studies, they found that LISA or MIS decreased the bronchopulmonary dysplasia at 36 week with the relative risk of 0.7 and confidence in within 95% between 0 0.05 or to 0 0.9. That means it's the, if you, 95%, that means if you take the same, um, if you take this sample study and you uh, use it for the entire population, you're gonna get the same result. That means more uh, precise result. The risk of the bronchopulmonary dysplasia among survival also decreased. Decreased the risk of the mechanical ventilation within 72 hours after birth. Also, they found this LISA or MIST decreased mechanical ventilation during the hospital stay. So those studies, it's promising. That's why in America now, there's multi-center trial running. They try to do a better job and try more evidence based so it's become more popular. There is meta-analysis also found that less invasive surfactant or LISA decreased bronchopulmonary dysplasia, death, IVH grade three and four, and pneumothorax compared with in short trials, which intubation, extubation. But again, all these study, um, the quality or, uh, of evidence, it's low based on the serious risk of the bias and blind, um, small sample size, heterogeneity among that study. I don't know, uh, I already explained. Uh, I'm gonna send uh, this um, presentation to Dr. Ayman. You guys, you can uh, look at the uh, YouTube and you can uh, watch the video. So let's discuss about, since we have time, more about mechanical ventilation. So you, baby, you place baby on CBAP, if I to go up to the best thirty percent or forty percent based on your study, you did the in short trials or LISA or MIST, you extubate the baby, baby again, he showed respect to distress, you you decided that I'm gonna intubate the baby. Then the question is which which mode you're gonna use? There is too many modes, but what I need you guys to know the principles. So there is Gregor's. There is servo, I'm sure there's Helmonton, and there's too many more of uh, the companies, but the principle is the same. So once you master the principle, then it's very easy to know the uh, differences or how to play with the vents. 
ايوه ايش آه رايك ناخذ بعض الاسئله على المحاضره الاولى لو انت اوريدي هذه يعني مفصوله شويه ده خلي ما نكمل خلي هولد ميكانيك اوف اندل فيري كويك ومحتاج نرجع لش اسمه حاضر اعطيني اعطيني اوكي اعطيني اوكي تمام 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 So if you decided to intubate the baby, which mode of ventilation you guys uh, pick? So I mean, since you speak up, so which mode of ventilation you're going to choose? SIMV mode. So SIMV mode. Uh, what about you, Dr. Ali? Also SIMV mode. So um, SIMV versus assistant control mode. So which one is superior, which one? So if you look at the literatures, most of them, they prefer assistant mode over the SIMV mode. Why? Mm. So that's come with the, um, with the principle of the SIMV versus uh, assistant mode. SIMV, what does it mean? So just to be able very quick, I'm going to go very quick, and then we can um, come back, or we can, maybe we can do a different time, discuss more in depth on the mechanical ventilation. The SIMV, You ask, so you put the rate, so let's assume that baby breath 60 beats per minute. So baby 60 breath per minute. You decided that I need a rate of 20 BIP. So uh, brother, uh, Dr. Ayman, when you said the SIMV, are you talking about volume guarantee or the pressure mode? Which mode you guys use? Pressure mode. Pressure mode. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, continue with Dr. Raymond and then we can uh, answer which one is better. So you decided 20, BIBO 5, and then pressure support of six. Just to give you like roughly, uh, so you guys understand. So in SIMV, what does mean? Whenever the rate, you're gonna place it, that's the machine is gonna give full BIB of 20, BIB of five, and I time, sorry, of the 0.35. So that means 20 over 60, 20 over 60 is gonna be, baby will receive 20 over five with I time 0.35. The wrist, which is 40 Brit, he's gonna be just supported with pressure support of six above the beep. What does mean? Six plus five, it's 11. You got it, correct? So here, um, um, I mean, maybe you should, uh, should say like a PIP is yeah. actually including the pressure control and the P. Yeah. So make so it easy. So in assistant control, what, very brief, what does mean? All breath is being controlled. That means the baby breath 40, doesn't matter. 60, everything is going to be fully controlled. So if the baby bread 40, he's going to get fully full. If the baby bread 60, is the, he's going to get toast. So then why we put the rate on the assistant control? We put the rate on the assistant control as a backup. In case the baby decided to have apnea or stop breathing, then the minimum allow for the vents to deliver is 40. Make sense? So that's assistant control. Versus a CIMV, whenever the rate you're going to sit, that's going to be fully controlled. The rest is going to be supported. So what's the evidence here? So the evidence support using assistant control and tiny baby. The reason why, because on the SIMV, although they are not big randomized control trial, those SIM baby on the SIMV, they have higher risk of the tachypnea, higher oxygen required, and more staying on the vents than baby on the assistant control, okay? Then which mode you gonna use? Are you gonna use um, since we said assistant control, are we going to use pressure or volume? Almost all the study, randomized control study, uh, meta-analysis study, confirm it that volume guarantee is superior than pressure. The risk of the the risk of the barotrauma higher than the risk of the volutrauma. So if you are dealing with a tiny baby, you need to avoid using pressure control. Make sense? The most of the study, almost all the study, support using that. There is 12 randomized control trials. What they found? Volume guarantee reduced 
combined death or bronchopulmonary dysplasia risk also reduce the risk of the pneumothorax, hypocarbia, duration of ventilation, IVH grade three or four. So that's one of the strategic way to manage baby. You choose a system control over a CIMV, volume guarantee over the pressure mode because of those studies. Most of the centers now, they use the volume guarantee. They try to avoid using the pressure mode. Make sense? Volume guarantee, so what does it mean? You set the volume, the vents gonna deliver the, the target volume that you set it in. So there is sensor at the, close to the baby is intubated, there's sensors. At that sensors, it's measured amount of the tidal volume baby received. And how they're gonna deliver tidal volume? By giving the pressure. So the pressure is variable, but try the, the machine tried the best to maintain the same tidal volume each time. Okay? And that's the standard care of all previous babies. The only issue, and that's the very important when you treat baby and when you use the volume guarantee, you need to pay attention to the leak. If you have constant leak, more than 60%, then you lose the volume guarantee. So whole idea of volume guarantee, I need, so normally, what's the setting we start with? We start four, four and a half to five, that's the range, four to five, that's the range of the tidal volume that usually we start with, okay? So the tidal volume that you set it, if the baby has leak 80%, like here, 88%, then it's not guaranteed anymore because already there is leak, big leak and it's constant leak. The only this condition, you need to move the baby to the different mode, which is pressure mode. Okay? And I will, we will talk inshallah next lecture more in detail about mechanical ventilation and we will draw pictures and inshallah. So what other intervention it's the, uh, we have? Caffeine. All baby less than 32 week gestation, less than 1500 gram, baby should start immediately on caffeine because multi-center tries confirm it. Caffeine reduce bronchopulmonary dysplasia than baby who not on caffeine, okay? Vitamin A, it used to be standard care and then all of a sudden nationwide shortage of vitamin A, it dropped from the market. Now people less likely, now came back, people less likely used because although in the evidence is show that uh, improved chronic lung disease, but it's been a years, baby, uh, people, they don't use it and they found there's no much changes happen on their um, incidence of chronic lung disease. In addition, vitamin A, you have to give it injection. It's not oral. So that's the reason. Okay, so in brief, very quick, you admit the baby, you do the delay cord clamp, it's very important either 30 seconds or complete 60 seconds, decrease the delay cord clamp, decrease the blood transfusion or risk of the blood transfusion. Then you use the non-invasive over the invasive. Surfactant, you limit it to the, or you move it to the rescue rather than prophylactic. If the baby required higher than 30 or 40 based on your center, then you have to give surfactant, extubate to the NIV or CBAP. Fluid, usually tiny baby, the, the lower the gestational age, higher fluid. The fluid usually starts 80 in babies who's like 34 or less. If baby younger the baby, you go higher, up to 100 in babies who's around 24 to 23 week gestation because insensible loss is high. And then you start surfactant and you do your best to avoid intubate the baby. If baby increase oxygen requirement, despite two, oxygen, uh, two doses of surfactant, then you switch him to the NIV. If baby need intubation, the whole, the goal to avoid volume trauma or parotrauma. And I'm gonna end up uh, here and I'm gonna leave for the questions. Okay, Dr. Ayman, thank you very much for your valuable uh, lecture.
it was great uh, and I highly appreciate it. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to uh, stress out uh, some points in your lecture, uh, which I see that's very important here in our practice uh, in Libya. Some, um, I don't know if most or some uh, Obsangaini doctors, they don't uh, give, they don't still um, they don't give um, a steroid for uh, any pregnant women who, who's um, uh, more than 34 weeks. They are still going with the old protocol. So uh, I want to stress this point that or for uh, to all of my uh, colleagues that when they discuss when the Obsangaini doctor, they should uh, open up this discussion and they should encourage them to give steroids for the women, pregnant ladies, uh, as long as uh, they need it, 36 weeks plus six days. This is the uh, first important point. The second important point about the briefing and debriefing. This is how we uh, audit ourselves. Um, the allocation of the jobs between the uh, resuscitation team. The third one is actually a question uh, from the one of the attendees, doctor. Uh, it's about what other criteria to give surfactant other than the FIO2 requirement. You say, Dr. Ayman, uh, thank you for uh, highlighting this uh, important point that higher than 30% in most of the yeah. USA center. Risk so what are, what are other doses. criteria other so than FIO2 requirement? This is the yes. first question, Dr. Ayman. Yeah, so um, if the baby, so, so what we do here, uh, practical, we don't do a lot of gases, but let's assume that you did a gas and baby has the pH less than 7.2, baby has a respiratory acidosis, high BCO2 and the pH is low. And in fact, uh, we don't do arterial gas, we do just capillary gas. And if the capillary gas came back less than 7.2, uh, which mainly respiratory acidosis, um, what I need to stress out, if you are in the middle of procedure or shortly after procedure, I don't want you to jump and give surfactant. Give the baby time. Uh, what we note, if you give the baby time, especially uh, you leave the baby alone, majority of time, baby will improve. Give him 30 minutes time. After 30 minutes, if you cannot win the FI2 and the baby clinically still granting, still, so it's, it's the whole package, the baby still respect your distress. Uh, granting um, 30 minutes to an hour after you finish the whole procedures, UVC, you align, whenever the lines that you decided to place. And then um, repeat the gas. If the gas still, uh, so for, for me, I don't repeat the gas. If the baby required, because once the CO2 is increased, baby start hypoxia and then start going up on oxygen. But if you did the gas and you, your BH less than 7.2 with mainly respiratory acidosis, that's another criteria. Okay, okay. thank you. Dr. Ayman, is this uh, um, approach the same for the second or and the third dose of surfactant or not? Yes, that's the for, uh, for all three, if you want to give. But I'm, getting, I'm telling you, only two, two times in my life I give third dose of surfactant, so it's not common. Uh, Dr. Ayman, another question, a uh, colleague of mine who sent this uh, scenario that goes uh, with this uh, Britain baby 28 weeker who born on flaccid and then received IPPV, then uh, given the first dose of surfactant. Uh, if I had a requirement, the reason for the first dose of surfactant was uh, he, the baby need more than 30%, around 45%. Uh, the question here, if I um, come ac across uh, a murmur, a machinery murmur, do I, in this time, in the first few hours of life, do I need to do echo at this, time, uh, at this point, or do I need to think about the PDA, or what's the approach here? So, so, so if I think of some sort of heart problem. So, so murmur, it's very common in tiny baby in very low birth weight baby. When we said very low birth weight, any baby less than 1,500 gram. So murmur itself does not indicate treatment and does not indicate to do anything. So what I recommend, because that's normal, so baby is gonna have BDA. And in Brimi, it takes up to three weeks for the BDA to close. So it's not like full-term baby um, immediately or first 70, uh, 72 hours of life. So Brimi's stay longer. 
So it depends on the center that you practice. Some centers, they are more friendly, um, or they are conservative. They don't give any treatment for the PDA. And that's the I'm willing with. So I'm more with fluid management. Uh, when, when you already examine the baby, let's assume that you expected a PDA. Uh, baby, um, there is machinery murmur, there is wide pulse pressure, uh, baby has metabolic acidosis, uh, urine output a little bit decreased, you restrict your fluid. Just by restricting your fluid, yes, there is chance that, and there's another topic maybe we can discuss separate about PDA and pathophysiology and uh, how, what's the option of treatment and how we treat the PDA, but I'm favored not to treat, just go clinically, restrict the fluid to 130 and monitor baby clinically. Some centers, they are more used to treat. Uh, there is three options, uh, and that's that if you are willing to treat, then yes, you can do echo. Uh, if you are um, that group of people that they are treated, um, but you need to take a risk versus the benefit. So there's always a risk of the um, perforation and kidney uh, with the treatment. If you decided to use the ibuprofen or endomethacin, it's more with the endomethacin. Um, some people or some studies now um, uh, start the acetaminophen and we use it here, uh, especially if the baby has the IVH, um, but uh, other than acetaminophen, I don't treat uh, at all. Um, when I joined this uh, team, me and uh, another physician, they used to treat a lot of them. They used to send them for the surgery, for BDA ligation. Once we, like um, I remember the last time we did BDA ligation almost two years ago and um, people, they start changing the practice. So, um, so that's the very big topics. But to point it to you, if you are saying um, that always when you order something, you're gonna react. So BDA, I know there's BDA. So the question is why you're gonna do echo? Are you gonna treat it? If you said, no, I'm gonna treat it, I'm gonna take the risk of the perforation, I'm gonna take the risk of them, I'm, gonna, um, I'm not gonna deal with the BDA, then uh, you can treat. Uh, but is it all just based on the murmur you're going to treat? That's wrong. Not the murmur to treat. If the baby start having, if you, if you decided to treat, let's assume that you are the second group of people that they are treat, the PDA. If you decide to treat the PDA, you have to have evidence of the symptomatic. That means baby has severe metabolic acidosis. Baby has the kidney. Um, if you have the um, creatinine, PUN creatinine increased. Uh, baby has the bush, like the wide pulse pressure very significant. Um, then you, you discussed with your uh, FI2 start trending up, baby has pulmonary edema, then you might consider treated. But just based on murmur, I'm going to do echo. Almost all, you, you will definitely, almost all, if you have dealing with 23, 24 weeker, almost all they have the BDA. Then that means all, all, all of them you're going to treat? The answer is no. Uh, I mean, uh, maybe best just like comment on the cell about the FI2. But anyway, on the center of the center, we don't just do the FI2. It is work of breathing, or escalating the ventilatory support, or the FI2 requirement more than 40%. Mm -hmm. This is an indication that it's affected. In this way, it's an indication that it's an indication. That's what I mean. Yeah, that's going back in the whole cell, the 28 weeker will be baby born floppy or got PBV. So I'm assuming in the baby intubated. In this case, you don't have to wait the FI2 requirement. You have to give prophylactic uh, surfactant, right? The, I don't know. I mean, yes, yes, yes. That's that's prophylactic. That's Any baby that's intubated definitely has to get it. Yes. So, so the her, So I uh, I agree with Dr. Bishop. So we said early, the FI2 alone shouldn't take the FI2 just by a lot. You have to look at the whole. Uh, can you guys please, whenever who has the mic, mute it. Please. So do not take the FI2 as a single parameter. You need to look at the whole picture. So, so you need to take the whole picture. The FI2 required respiratory support, baby granting, then yes. If the baby 28 week are already floppy, you already need to get the baby, then it's better to give surfactant. The only indication to give surfactant if the baby intubated or worsening, let's assume the baby has pneumonia, 
or worse in respiratory status and you think this baby has pneumonia, then you already intubate the baby, just give it. Or if, even if not intubated, if you think that it has severe pneumonia or meconium like these conditions, we know meconium can displace the surfactant and uh, mislead the surfactant function or misfunction of the surfactant, then yes, you can give it here. There's nothing wrong with give surfactant. Uh, okay, Dr. Ayman, I have a couple of questions here. Uh, uh, some of them may be related to the practice of the Opsangani doctor. Uh, just uh, to uh, to tell you that uh, betamethasone is not available here in Libya. So as a substitute, we use uh, dexamethasone. So do you know any difference between betamethasone and dexamethasone in the effectiveness? Have you come across any data uh, relating to this uh, topic? Uh, mm -hmm. The second the second mm -hmm. question. Uh, sorry. Uh -huh. um, I will just review uh, my notes and I will go, I will tell you the other question, okay? Okay, so um, steroids, betamethasone, dexamethasone, the recommendation is the same, as far as I know. There is no difference in recommendation, both of them, they recommend either one. Uh, people, they prefer here in America, they prefer betamethasone over dexamethasone, uh, the duration or the, the injection twice, um, every 12 hours on the betamethasone. Um, there is, um, I remember a long time ago, I read about dexamethasone has superior, um, slightly, um, I don't want to say something I'm not sure 100%. So the answer to this one is that both recommendation is the same and the, both of them should be given early, um, less than 37 week gestation. It's just the, the, the interval of treatment, betamethasone given every 12 hours, more frequent than dexamethasone. Uh, okay, thank you. Dr. Raymond, about caffeine, one question about the caffeine use. Do you use it regularly before extubation of any preterm infant from mechanical ventilator or not? We use for all baby immediately. When the baby born, we don't wait. So caffeine immediately, one of the admission, uh, we have the admission set, the caffeine, one of those. So it's immediately, once the baby born, start baby on caffeine. We give a loading dose because we know the caffeine has very long tea have life. Um, almost 120 hours. So um, we give a loading dose, which is 20 milligram per kg, and then a maintenance dose uh, every uh, 24 hour. Um, the maintenance dose, that's the uh, variation from one center to the other. The recommendation start by five milligram per kg. Here we use, people, they start looking at the higher dose and we are adopting, that's the recommendation. So we start maintenance dose is 10 milligram per kg. Uh, but nothing wrong if you start with five. My training, we used to give five milligram per kg and maintenance, but start with loading dose. So to bring the baby at the therapeutic level or the um, um, therapeutic range, um, then you start the maintenance dose. Okay, man, I'm uh, just going to ask something, Malishi. So um, like dexamethasone or betamethasone, in terms of the institution we work, we have 24 plus 0 to 33 plus 6. I mean, the guidelines change, but we still practice the, maybe the old guidelines. But not all, not all the institutions all over the U.S. they're practicing the new guidelines. The difference, uh, which one you prefer, dexamethasone or betamethasone? I mean, gal betamethasone, I agree, but the dexamethasone associated with reduced risk of IVH, intraventricular hemorrhage. Only one trial, um, they found association with decreased intensive care unit admission, like we can examine the dexamethasone, but the betamethasone, but overall, the betamethasone best. So, uh, the recommend I discussed with the uh, OBGY, the recommendation, the standard should be given any baby, uh, any mom, sorry, less than 37 weeks. If you go to the recommendation uh, from the ACOG, they, they uh, specifically mention anyone less than 34 week gestation, she should receive steroids. And then if mom less than 30 uh, or more than 34 weeks, and she planned for C-section or reterm labor within seven days, then uh, you have to give it, it's recommended to give the uh, betamethasone. It's, uh, I agree with Dr. Um, Faisal, there is variation. 
here because some they follow the ACOG, some they follow the maternal, fetal maternal medicine, and some based on the practice. Uh, there is variation, uh, but um, most, at least what I know from the centers that I trained and here and uh, practice, they start widely used of the, of the steroids early as early as the, um, or the anyone less than 37 weeks. Thank you, Dr. Ayman. I think I have the last question here. Uh, uh, it's it, uh, about, it about the resuscitation uh, of preterm baby, how much oxygen requirement, how much the startup oxygen? Uh, that's the very good question. Concentration. So, yes, so the, according to the NRB, um, the recommendation from 21 to 30 percent. Um, so the recommendation is you start any baby premature, you start with either 21 up to 30 percent. The center that, cutoff. yeah, so the cutoff is 30 percent. So in my center, what we and both when during my training and here, you we use 30 percent in premature baby, and um. The American Academy Pediatric, they range it. So the NRB, they range it from 21 to 30. But everyone, uh, almost that's what I'm aware of, they use cutoff of 30%. In yeah, yeah. Like, uh, like yeah, yeah. as I said, as you said, I mean, um, less than 35 weaker and above, we use uh, 21%. Less than 35 weaker, uh, it's uh, 21 to 30%. And you can see so, the variation too. So some centers, yep. they specify 35 and above. Uh, some centers, any premature baby, they use 30%. A full-term baby, they use room air. Uh, but the NRB, they are left it open. You know, like some other institution, I mean, uh, especially in Buffalo, New York, they use 100% when they resuscitate the babies. Immediately. Even yeah, like... But, uh, but, but that's baby. Not, yeah, but that's not recommended. Yes, yes. So, yeah, so that's agree. not NRB. So I'm the NRB structure. That's not the recommendation. The recommendation is that if you want to use oxygen, no more than the cut point is the 30% on any premature baby. Um, the NRB, they left it open, but 30% that most of the center they use as cutoff point. Thank you, Dr. Ayman. I have uh, one more question. So about the, for how long you continue your caffeine uh, for Britain babies? Is it for so, the 34 week or yes. less so, than that? Yeah, so the recommendation for the caffeine, we use the caffeine. Uh, so there's a couple of the uh, policy. I'm gonna come to caffeine and then I will um, mention a couple of the protocols. So the caffeine usually we continue till 34 weeks. Doesn't mean that after 34 weeks we have to stop. Some people they left at 36 weeks, but the majority of us, we leave it around 33, 34 weeks. If the baby, let's say I have 33 week gestation and baby never have any uh, events on the last uh, three weeks. When I said events, that means no Brady, no DSAS, no, nothing in the last three weeks. Then I, I don't have to wait till uh, 34 week gestation. But the cut point majority of centers they use 34 weeks. Um, if the baby still like at around 34 weeks still have the events of Brady reset, some people they move it to or 36 or 37 week gestation. So that's the uh, when we start caffeine, any baby less than 32 weeks doesn't mean we don't use it after. No, we use it if. So let's assume you have 33 or 34 weeks and baby has multiple events of Brady set, then you first, you need to rule out the other causes like um, baby anemia can have apnea. If the baby sepsis can have apnea, IVH can be apneic. So you rule out those uh, and then reflux itself can be, if baby, the feeding tube touching the vagal stimulation can, uh, or baby hypersensitivity to the vagus nerve, then he can have Brady and then followed by the uh, DSATs and apnea. If you rule out those causes, then you can start. There's nothing wrong with start after 32 uh, week gestation. But any baby less than 32 weeks, immediately from the admission, we start caffeine. There's other protocols, what we do, um, any baby less than uh, 32 weeks, we, baby has to have the ultrasound exam around seven days of life and then repeated around 28 days of life, looking for the IVH. Why we choose seven days of life? Because 99% of the bleed happen in the first seven days of life. So instead of jumping and do ultrasound each time, you wait until the seven days to catch around 99% of cases. And then remaining 1%, that's when we do around 28 days of life. If there is any BVL, which is very ventricular leukomalacia, um, 
at the time it can be uh, clear. So in one person, small bleed, later on changing to the ischemic changes and change it to the cystic, uh, then you can catch it around um, uh, 28 days of life. Anytime before seven days, if you are concerned about your baby, you can uh, order the ultrasound. But if the baby is stable, we we'll, we'll leave the ultrasound around seven days of life. I mean, uh, just like one thing about the caffeine, we still use it. Like even like for babies 41 and 42 weeks, we we still using caffeine on them, to be honest. Yeah, on, on admission? Since like, let's say, well, um, like a tra transfer baby from outside, he's on caffeine and he comes for surgery or for something. We just continue. If he continue to have A's and B's and D's, he just continue caffeine like till 42, 43. We when have ba one baby actually, 45 weeker, corrected gestational age and he's still on caffeine. That's, uh, that's what I'm saying. Baby, usually the cut line is the 34 weeks. But let's assume, let's assume that you have a baby who's continue to have it. Then you continue. You don't have any other option. You continue until baby become mature. If that's the underlying cause, if you think that's really the caffeine related to the, or the apnea related to the prematurity. And then you, you will see the variation. So the recommendation, that's around 34 weeks. And then the variation. The other question is, how long are you gonna keep baby on CBAP? So let's assume that we place baby on the CBAP, premature baby, for how long are you gonna keep baby on CBAP? And that's also, it's variation. The recommendation, a lot of centers based on the practice, they leave baby on CBAP till the 32 week corrected when they try to challenge the baby. Um, is it all centers they do the same? No, some center, they try the baby even on high flow nasal cannula early. Um, there is a couple of study, uh, look at the lung uh, growth and development long term. They found that if you leave baby on CBAP, it has better uh, outcome and uh, less likely to have obstructive lung disease. So it's not only for the oxygen requirement, also for the growth and development. So that's their recommendation to keep baby on CBAP. But um, does they use the, the, like all of them, they follow this? No, a couple of centers they use, especially when we have high flow nasal cannula called Vebotur, they use the Vebotur um, early. They don't wait until 32 weeks gestation. Dr. Amin, have you ever prescribed any alternative to caffeine? Because uh, most of the time we don't have caffeine here and we, as a substitute, we use uh, aminophilin. So aminophilin. I know it's a risky it, drug, it, but... Uh, yeah, it's very old practice. So when I, a uh, uh, long time ago, I used to be in Libya, um, we used the aminophilin. But uh, we know the aminophilin is risky. Um, if you don't have it, unfortunately, we have to use it. But you need to know the risk. That's the whole idea. Any other questions? Shukran jazeelan, Dr. Ayman. Barakallahu feek wa jazakallahu kul khair. Bi'awun Allah nasqo ala muhadarat taniya lau andak wakit akid taba'an. Dr. Ayman, next topic should be either pulmonary hypertension or PDA. You have to choose. Dr. Ayman, can, can okay. I just have a, a, one more question, please? Yes, yeah, so okay. All right. Uh, I just want to ask uh, our colleague who said we, we get the caffeine for uh, until the baby is uh, 41 or 42 weeks gestation. Um, could you please tell us the rationale behind this? There are some studies actually showed even caffeine in uh, corrected gestation at age 40 and above it still works. No, no, the the point I'm trying to raise is, I mean, if your baby is off CPAP, he is mature, not having apneas, and you know you're planning to discharge the baby. I mean, no, no, no. Why no. we continue? We the... the... No, no. I said if the baby continue to have A's and B's and these, then we continue caffeine. I'm not saying if the baby he doesn't have he, the baby has symptomatic, absolutely, like 34 weeker, or just like this. All right. <laughs> oh no, sorry, I missed out. Uh, yeah, no, no. No so, so, so the bottom line, you need to continue. If you start caffeine and baby, you stop the caffeine. Usually, I just need to know, once you stop caffeine, you have to wait yep. at least seven days. So seven to 10 days varies from one center to another because we have we know long to have life. So let's assume that each time you stop caffeine, baby start having um, apnea, Brady, DSATs, and it shouldn't be on the same day or second day because we know that you have life is very long. 
So right. you should see the effect of caffeine at least five days um, minimum. So let's assume that babies start having DSATs, apnea each time. Yes, I agree with Dr. Uh, Bishu. Um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Faisal, uh, yes, you need to continue okay. caffeine um, till baby become mature, which is around 42 week gestation. Uh, each time you take a chance, uh, try to take it off, if baby continue, then go back to the uh, caffeine. All right. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, so uh, it's just uh, the last question I have uh, regarding the aminophilin. Let's say we've got a baby with congenital heart disease and you know, um, caffeine is not available in Libya. Do you perhaps have any other alternative to that? How many weeks do you guys get, uh, resuscitate? Like what you are asking, the how many weeks gestation? Uh, let's say this baby is 31 weeks. So 31 weeks, if baby 31 weeks, really I don't have to give, you don't have to give any. Uh, if, the, if the baby congenital heart disease, just leave baby on the CBAP. Uh, if the baby has apnea, you can place baby on an IV, where they have a rate. If you guys don't have, um, if you, you have to weigh the risk versus benefit, the risk here of the aminophilin is very high. Then uh, 34, 32 weeks, 31 weeks, leave the baby on an IV where you can get some rate. At least you wake the baby each time. And um, that's it. All right. So then we just wait until the baby becomes more mature and, you know, less ethnic and all of that. All right. Exactly. Thank you so much. Exactly. Any more questions? So uh, I'm going to wait for uh, you to contact me, inshallah. Um, I prefer uh, Dr. Beshio, uh, Dr. Faisal, if you don't mind, uh, for the next lecture because we run very quick on the mechanical ventilation and I'm sure majority of the of the colleagues here, um, they uh, interested to know the differences, uh, basic of the mechanical ventilation. Um, but uh, I promise, inshallah, uh, if we continue, inshallah, we, I will give the pulmonary hypertension. Uh, I have a presentation about baby chin and uh, PDA also with the different uh, treatment strategy, inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you. Inshallah. جزاكم الله خيرا السلام عليكم